morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here on such short notice. As I know, you reached out with some questions, so I wanted to get everyone together. I wanted to uh, briefly reflect on my recent decisions on H57 and the S169. And I know these decisions are still on the minds of many. As you know, Monday I signed H57, a bill that protects reproductive rights in Vermont. Like many Vermonters, I believe in a woman's right to make their own health care choices, and the government should not interfere. The legislation that I did sign affirms what is already allowable in Vermont. It protects reproductive rights and ensures those decisions remain between a woman and her health care provider. For these reasons, I believe it was important to sign this bill, even though I know we, knew, we don't all agree and some are disappointed. <clears throat> I also know there is disappointment over my decision to veto S-169. I understand and accept that, but let me be clear. There is and will continue to be tremendous work to make our communities safer, to protect our citizens, and to prevent tragedies like suicides and other acts of violence. I want to take a moment to go through some of the initiatives outlined after the Fairhaven incident in my February 2018 memo to the legislature and where we've made some progress. In the area of gun safety and supply, last year I called for and the legislature passed a package of historic gun safety reforms. These measures included extreme risk protection orders, which gave families the tools to remove guns from those who may harm themselves or others allowing law enforcement to remove firearms from those accused of domestic violence, increasing the age to buy a firearm from 18 to 21, expanding mandatory background check requirements, banning bump stocks and prohibiting the purchase of high capacity magazines, and more. It also called for, and we implemented, a school safety audit and $5 million in grants for safety infrastructure for schools. And importantly, it advocated for a focus on improving the health and mental health of our citizens. In this category, we propose and have made some progress in addressing capacity needs at mental health facilities and increasing investment for DCF in support of young kids impacted by opioids. My administration has recommended increased funding for mental health outreach workers boots on the ground, so to speak, in high need communities, as well as home visit uh, programs with a focus on families impacted by addiction. While these investments were not supported by the legislature, it's an area where we should continue to focus. I also established a violence protection task force, which submitted its first set of recommendations to me last week. To be clear, I still need to review this report but I know it does include further gun safety measures, which I'll take a serious look at. As well, community health initiatives like expanding the Department of Mental Health's Zero Suicide Program and more mental health supports in schools. I know there probably won't be consensus to act on every initiative, but I believe focusing on the underlying causes of violence and suicide should be our top focus. As I said in my veto message, I don't believe the bill that came to my desk this week addresses these underlying factors or would achieve the public safety goals it aimed to achieve. I believe these concerns are shared by legislators of different parties in the House and Senate. Disagreeing on the impact of a 24-hour delay for handgun purchases, however, does not mean we don't all share the goal to prevent suicide and acts of violence. I also think it's important to note, for better or for worse, in the eyes of some, Vermont would have no gun safety regulations if it wasn't for my advocacy and willingness to keep an open mind. As I've shown and you've reported on, gun safety is an area I'm willing to advocate for and support, which is not something I believe any other governor in Vermont's history can say. I'm simply not persuaded a 24-hour waiting period on handguns will have the desired outcome. And there isn't a waiting period measure that gives us an apples-to-apples -apples comparison to assess the impact. Moving forward, we can work together to address these underlying causes. And if there are gun safety reforms, I will continue to consider the positive and negative impacts of every proposal 
to improve the safety and health of our communities. So with that, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. Governor, yesterday <coughs> the, uh, the blacks called your decision cowardly and they're understandably disappointed and upset, but when you hear that, when you hear that, that they think your action was cowardly, what, how does that make you feel? Well, I certainly understand um, their, their disappointment, their anger, their grief, the pain. I can't imagine, um, uh, as a father of, of two, uh, two girls, um, what I would be going through if I was in their position. Um, so um, I accept that. Uh, they have their opinion. Uh, the, uh, the veto wasn't based on strictly their, uh, their um, standpoint. Uh, but um, but I understand it. What were you looking for in the way of data to justify signing this bill that you did not find? Well, I just didn't find any comparisons uh, with a 24-hour waiting period on handguns alone uh, that was apples to apples. As well with anything that I did find in terms of waiting periods in the uh, 10 states, uh, nine other states I believe that have enacted this, uh, this uh, waiting periods. <coughs> They didn't have an apples to apples comparison to the uh, legislation we passed last year. Uh, red flag provisions, uh, uh, extreme risk uh, protection uh, orders, and so forth. Um, none of them had that uh, in comparison, in comparison to what we've done. So, I believe what we uh, accomplished last year um, was the right thing to do at the right time, and I believe that they, they will. Uh, there's some benefits to what we're we're going to see now and in the future as a result of that so legislation. You're, you're not convinced that this would prevent suicides or gun deaths? I'm not, I'm not convinced a 24-hour waiting period uh, for handguns alone uh, will do that. Do you think it would have saved any lives? I have no way of knowing that. Is it possible it could have saved lives? Um, I think there's a lot of possibilities, a lot of actions we take uh, day in and day out in the legislature that could, uh, could save lives that we don't act on. Um, there is nothing uh, conclusive uh, to anything we do, um, but uh, but again, uh, it's about balance, about trying to find uh, trying to find uh, opportunities uh, for us uh, to, uh, to to live the free lives we want, uh, as well as protect uh, the innocent. You're saying, though, at the same time that you remain open to additional restrictions <coughs> on gun ownership. Well, I think uh, we have to be. Um, open-minded uh, in uh, across uh, the country in terms of uh, what we can do to protect our citizens and what's uh, what's effective and what's not uh, again I think that we need to uh, I, and I've, I've been consistent in saying that we did a lot last year uh, it's monumental in many respects and I think we need to give that an opportunity to work and I think we need to uh, allow Vermonters to adjust to that and to use that uh, in uh, and again, with the red flag legislation in particular, I think that that, uh, that could be beneficial if more people uh, understood it and, uh, and uh, advocate for it more. Is the task force report available or are you withholding it until you review it? I, I would like to withhold that until I review it and it is on my to-do list. Does it include a waiting period? Um, not that I, I, I haven't reviewed it in in depth, I just breezed through it, but I did not see any waiting period there. You you mentioned Vermont or S one sixty nine in comparison to other states' waiting periods. Um, do you believe any of those other states' waiting periods are effective and save lives? Well, I, I think they could. I mean, there, I think the extreme uh, might have been Hawaii, maybe with a ten day waiting period. Um, that, that may be effective. I mean, it's, it's again, hard to, to correlate the two. I'm not sure what they have, um, if they have extreme risk uh, protection orders, um, red flag legislation, whether they, I don't know what they, um, if, if their age is 18 or 21. I just don't know all the other details that fit into what we did last year, because it does make a difference. Would you consider a longer waiting period? Um, again, I'm looking for something that's uh, effective, uh, some data to back it up. I would like to see what, uh, what we, if what we did uh, is effective, and, uh, and I'll consider and be open-minded to anything. But, but again, I don't believe a 24-hour waiting period for the handguns only 
is <laughs> when, you, when you say not effective, I'm confused as to whether it's because it's too short and people would just simply wait the 24 hours, or uh, I guess could you clarify why? You well, the, the law that was brought to me, that was passed by the legislature, uh, I just don't think it's effective. I don't think the 24 hours is effective. Would, so would 48 or 72 hours be effective? Uh, I would be happy to look at the data and can make that comparison. But I, again, I want to see what we've, the action we took last year was significant. I think we can all agree to that. And uh, I think we need to allow Vermonters to become adjusted to that. Are you going to meet with the Blacks and explain your decision on that? I did meet uh, with the Blacks uh, during the legislative session. Um, I made no promises. I listened uh, to their heartbreaking story. and. Uh, and to say that it didn't have an effect on me uh, wouldn't be the truth. Uh, it obviously did, and I and I feel uh, a great amount of sympathy uh, for what they've gone through. But again, I have to balance what I think is uh, right for the state uh, versus my emotions. So that's a no. To meet with them, yeah. if they if they would like to meet with me, I would be happy to meet with them. Um, the chattering class is gaming out the political implications of these. And your decisions on them. Um, Peter Shumlin announced in June of the year before uh, the next election that he was not going to be running. Uh, you decided whether or not you're going to see him. Oh, you? no. I, I, again, it was just uh, five or six months ago that I was sworn into office. I think I'm going to let that ride out a little longer. Have another <laughs> session to go through. You would, you would consider announcing that you're not seeking re election? after the next legislative session? I think that would be fair to say. I mean, any decision will come after the legislative session. Um, I, you know, I think it's just way too early. Um, what made you decide to sign H-57 opposed to just letting it become law without your signature? I thought, I thought it was important to make a statement uh, in terms of seeing what's happening throughout our country and other states making maybe the exact opposite, uh, taking the exact opposite approach. And I thought it was important uh, for me to step up uh, because it's what I believe. I, I don't believe government should be involved in healthcare decisions uh, between uh, a person and a provider. Could it have been an important statement given the fact that a lot of your fellow Republicans are pushing in the opposite direction? Wouldn't this be a time to make a really definitive statement by signing it in public? Well, it could be, uh, but uh, but again, uh, I mean, I mean I'll, I'll talk about the practicality of all this. Uh, and we receive, uh, as you know, uh, a, a number of bills all at once. Uh, we received a number of bills last uh, last week. Uh, they were all built up. There was probably 15 bills uh, that were due in two days. We have a lot to do in terms of reviewing, a lot to do in terms of uh, my decision making. Uh, and when I want to take all the time necessary to do that. And when you do that, uh, there's not really uh, enough time to put a public uh, signing together. Uh, so again, I thought it was, uh, reflecting on it over the last few days, uh, I thought it was uh, necessary to sign it, uh, put my name on it, and uh, be held accountable for it. Why did we see or hear from you on these two big decisions at the same time. What was your thinking in that? They were both due at the same time, practically within 24 hours or, you know, in, in one sense, uh, yeah, within 24 hours of each other. So I just thought it was important to, to make the decision and because I know that it was on the, on the minds of many. Uh, they were both uh, talked about a lot. So I thought it was important to make that at the same time. And when did you make that decision? Are those decisions? Uh, I would say on Monday. You know, over the weekend, I you know uh, did a lot of thinking over the weekend, uh, and a lot of contemplating, soul searching, and so forth, and came to that conclusion over the weekend. Told my uh, told my staff on uh, Monday morning. There are a lot of members of your own party who are concerned about H fifty seven. That the protections that it offers go beyond what Roe versus Wade offers. Were you weighing those concerns and making your decision? Were there, was there ever any concern that this bill went too far? Yeah, there was no political concerns uh, for me. Um, it was just something that, uh, that I had to come to grips with. I wanted to reflect and talk with my family and friends and just so that uh, I was, I, I knew for sure what I wanted to do. And, and I wanted to make sure that I did it for the right reasons. And 
the right reasons for me was pretty basic. Just the government should stay out of those decisions, shouldn't interject, intercede in those decisions between a, a, a person and their health care provider. I just fundamentally don't believe government should be involved. Your statement about S-169, and you repeated it this morning, uh, talked about the fact that it didn't address the underlying causes, um, which, to be really direct, you could say the same about chemotherapy and cancer. Uh, it doesn't address the underlying causes, it just treats the illness. And if you have a bill, if you have a mechanism that interrupts that immediate Andrew Black situation where he feels overwhelmed, he buys a gun and kills himself within hours, um, that would seem to be a very uh, useful circuit breaker, even if it doesn't address the underlying causes. But at the same time, if we, um, if we go away with signing a bill, proposing a bill, signing a bill, and putting it into, uh, into law, and um, it doesn't address the underlying issues, and we go away uh, patting ourselves on the back uh, that we saved uh, another life, how uh, many other lives uh, are we putting at risk for not addressing it? So I think it's, uh, it's important uh, that we take that step. Uh, that we address those uh, those issues, the underlying root causes. Uh, again, we put a lot of put a lot of things in place uh, last year. I think the extreme risk uh, protection orders are, are can be effective, and I think that we should. And if they need to be changed in some way, um, modified in some way to make them more effective, then we should then we should move forward on that. Well, the protection orders don't uh, don't address the underlying causes of domestic violence. No, but, but again, um, getting to those uh, root causes, at least addressing the issue and maybe getting them, uh, identifying that there is an issue uh, at that point and getting them into programs that will help, uh, I think uh, has a, a desired effect uh, as opposed to a 24-hour waiting period that just uh, puts it off possibly for 24 hours without ever um, identifying and highlighting uh, that there is an issue. Uh, Governor, this morning, Christina Nolan, U.S. Attorney Nolan, uh, announced federal charges against Veronica Lewis um, after state charges were dismissed. Have you had conversations, you or your team, with the U.S. Attorney about federal charges against the three cases that were dismissed by Sarah George? We were, um, we were made aware of the U.S. Attorney's uh, decision to move forward with charges yesterday. Um, so uh, I think this is uh, good news. A lot of respects and, uh, and I applaud her for doing so. Do you expect the U.S. Attorney to seek federal charges against the other two defendants? I'm, uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, that's obviously her decision uh, and, uh, and, I, uh, and I applaud the Attorney General uh, for he sent uh, a letter. I think some of you have reported on that, seen the letter where he is going to review those cases. Um, so I think that's good news as well. Um, a lot of people I'm curious to see what you're going to do with the medical monitoring bill. Have you made any decisions on that yet? We just received that yesterday, um, and uh, I've been a little busy with some other things, so uh, that's next on the list as well. Are you happy with the uh, results of helping the business community in this session? I think we um, we had a good <laughs> session in many respects, uh, a good balance of a uh, number of initiatives that I think will be will be helpful um, in terms of uh, trying workforce development in particular. Uh, and I think that that's something that we'll have to continue to try and address in the next uh, next half of the biennium. Uh, I think it's that important. But um, but again, the economy is uh, doing uh, fairly well. Uh, it could be doing better. Uh, but our workforce challenges are, are probably uh, the root cause or the demographics are the root cause of uh, of some of what we're seeing, and uh, and again, if we can if we can fill uh, fill the jobs that are available, uh, and bring more people into the state, I think that will uh, be beneficial to uh, our budgetary issues and, and some of the challenges we face in that uh, in that area. Do you have any disappointments? Um, there's always disappointments in every session. Uh, we don't uh, none of us get all we want, but I think uh, all in all, I think everyone it was a good session. Very civil and respectful. We listen to one another, and um, and in the end, I think we, uh, I think Vermonters should be proud of what we did. It seemed you slow down on trying to cut school costs. 
Well, I'm a realist, um, and uh, you know, I tried that uh, for the first two years. I didn't have a, a willing partner in that respect, and so um, I need to focus on areas where you know we can be effective. And I think the demographic issues, the workforce challenges, and so forth, are something that seems to be catching on. Uh, legislators are are more aware of that uh, than ever, and uh, have worked uh, hand in hand with us and come up with initiatives as well uh, that can be helpful. So. I'm trying to focus on areas uh, that we have common goals, and uh, and and that doesn't mean the other uh, the education uh, challenges that we face goes away. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'm not willing uh, to work with them, but uh, but when they're ready, uh, I'm I'm there, ready, willing, and able. Are you working on major proposals for next year? Always, such as uh, we're working on. <laughs> uh, you said you'd like to work with uh, lawmakers on addressing the underlying problems of violence and suicide. Can, can Vermonters expect your budget and your uh, state of the state address next year to lay out concrete proposals that you can identify back to this moment and say, this is what I've come up with? Uh, quite possibly. It may be a resurrection of some things we've, we've offered as well but that they didn't, uh, they didn't <clears throat> accept. I think having embedding more counselors into the communities is a good idea. Uh, I think uh, more early care and learning is essential. Uh, I think that uh, we can do do more in all kinds of different areas, areas that we proposed and maybe uh, wasn't the right time uh, for them to consider, but uh, but I think you'll see that. We, we've had, uh, since I took office, we've, we've increased investment, and in not just from us, but from the legislature as well, increased investment in mental health. Um, significantly uh, year after year. So it's not as though uh, we've moved back on that commitment, uh, but, uh, but I think that we need to continue to highlight because we all know, uh, as, we, as we have uh, seen, uh, we, we, along with many other states, have mental health issues uh, that we need to address. Just curious, you still have the apartment back there? You turned that into offices? No. Um, it's still back there, but I don't use it as an apartment, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I live kind of fairly, fairly near. I don't think anybody really has. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate you being here.